Let's read together from Genesis chapter 14, verse 8 to verse 24. Right, Genesis chapter 14, 8 to 24. Are you ready? Let's declare the word of God together. Then the rebel kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Edma, Zeboim, and Bela, also called Zoar, prepared for battle in the valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against King Kidolaoma of Elam, King Tidal of Goim, King Amraphel of Babylonia, and King Ariok of Eleazar. Four kings against five. As it happened, the valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits, while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. They also captured Lot, Abraham's nephew, who lived in Sodom, and carried off everything he owned. But one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abraham the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mamre the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Ashkol and Anna, were Abraham's allies. When Abraham heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men he had, who had been born into his household. Then he pursued Kedol Laoma's army until he caught up with them at Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Kedol Laoma's army fled, but Abraham chased them as far as Hobah north of Damascus. Abraham recovered all the goods that had been taken and he brought them back, his nephew Lot, with his possessions and all the women and other captives. After Abraham returned from his victory over Kedol Laoma and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High, brought Abraham some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give back my people who are captured, but you may keep for yourself all the goods you have recovered. Abraham replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal tongue from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I am the one who made Abraham rich. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Anna, Eskol, and Memory. Last week, I spoke to you about the realities in moving with God. Let's do a quick quiz, shall we? What were they? Can you remember? You know, I know sometimes, very often, People forget what pastor said at the moment they leave the service. Put as many as you can remember into the comment box. What were the realities that we talked about in moving with God last week? Okay. Number one was... Famine, right? There can be famine even in the promised land. Number two, character will be exposed, especially our character faults. 
And number three, vision will be threatened. That what happens with us is very often part of a bigger picture. And what we respond with will also affect the bigger picture. And then finally, God's will cannot be thwarted. Very good. All right. I trust most of you have got at least two or three of those right. Today, I want to speak to you on moving with God, lessons from the life of Abraham, and it's part four, entitled Battle, Booty, and Honor. Turn to your neighbor and say, battle. And then your neighbor can answer, booty. <laughs> and everyone say, honor. In the history of nations, it was common that tribal groups plot and fight against each other for territory and control. These groups were led by kings or, in, and in most, actually in most cases, tribal chiefs. And often these chiefs would form alliances among themselves to gain political and military advantage over other groups. And violent conflicts between these tribes and clans break out regularly. Genesis chapter 14 recorded one of these wars. In fact, this is the first war we read about in the Bible a coalition of five tribal kings from Sodom, Gomorrah, Edma, Zeboim, and Bela fought against an alliance of four others from Elam, Goim, Babylonian, and Elassa, led by a man called Kido, Kido Laoma. The Kido Laoma camp won the battle and they plundered the cities and towns of the five kings, including Sodom. And right there, we are given a sad report. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 12, they also captured Lot, Abraham's nephew, who lived in Sodom and carried off everything he owned. Go back to Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 to 12. Read together, Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lot or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lot destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom. Note this, Lot moved, to, moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. Now, we saw earlier, instead of deferring to his uncle, Lot picked what he saw was an advantage. We read in uh, verse 12, he pitched his tents near Sodom. But now in chapter 14, verse 12, he was in Sodom. What happened? Lot lived by what he saw. He was a person who lived only by sight. Attracted by what he saw, he gradually, from being near Sodom, got sucked into Sodom itself. You know, almost every seduction, temptation, comes through our eyes. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, we with me, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Lot fell for what he saw in Sodom in spite of the wickedness of his culture. And now he pays the price for his ungodly choices. He and his family got caught up in this violence 
and became prisoners of war. Let that be a warning for all of us. But fortunately for Lot, one of his servants escaped and reported his plight to Abram. And we read that Abram mobilized 318 of his clan and some allies and went in pursuit of the army of Kedar Lauma. I want to share with you some truths from Abram's war on Kedor Laoma. Truth number one, and this is very important, choose battles wisely. So everybody say, choose battles wisely. Choose your battles wisely. Abram avoided getting involved in the conflict between the kings. There are lots of conflict going on around you. Family foods, company politics, yeah? and of course today we have what are called culture wars even. Let me ask you this. How many of you got into serious arguments with friends over Donald Trump in American politics lately? How hot did that become? So, what if you were right and your friend was wrong? Was it worth ruining your relationship over? You know, many of the things people quarrel and fight over are actually quite trivial. Did you realize it? Someone told me how he and his wife in their early marriage quarrel over how to squeeze toothpaste. <laughs> and his wife would squeeze from the bottom of the tube and he would squeeze it from the middle. And she would insist that's the best way to get the most out of the tube. And they quarrel over that. How should we resolve that? Have you encountered this in your own life? And maybe you're the middle squeezer. Yeah? Your wife is the bottom squeezer. What's the solution? Are you still fighting over that? Is it worth the loss of peace and the breakdown in communication over something like that? What's the solution? May I recommend one? Use two tubes. One his, one hers. <laughs> and you can squeeze any way you like. <laughs> right? So how do we determine whether a battle is worth fighting? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 25 to 30, remember when we talk about uh, defeating our giants? This is back to David again. Read with me, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 25 to 30. Have you seen the giant? The man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And this man gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the man. He was angry. What are you doing around here anyway? He demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just wanted to see the battle. What have I done now? David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Which battle did David choose to fight? The answer? The one which will bring him a reward. You know he could have gone to battle with his older brother who was ridiculing him? You know, they could, he could start a quarrel with him, justify his action, and uh, maybe tell his brother off uh, in a few words. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He simply walked away to talk to other people and to find out things that he needed to know. But what if 
he had stayed and argued with his brother to try to justify his presence and to try to show his brother something about himself. He would get angry, uh, he would spend a lot of energy and maybe even lose his focus. It would distract him and cause him to miss the opportunity to kill his giant. You know, there are many people like that around us. There are people who say bad things about you behind your back. There are people who pick on little things to prove that they are smarter and stronger than you. But before you spend your time and energy fighting them, trying to prove they are wrong and you are right, think about this. What will you gain after you said your piece? You cannot change them or their opinions about anything overnight. But they can get between you and God's purpose for your life. Abraham went to war to rescue the people he loved. That's worth fighting for. You know, it would be so easy for Abraham to say that Lot deserved what he got. Lot was smart, but now he's a slave because of selfish choice. Why are so many pastors in Singapore battling against LGBTQ activism? Because of what we see as the reward. It has to do with the spiritual and moral climate of Singapore. We don't want our children and grandchildren to inherit a nation under tyranny. This giant tyrant of LGBTQ activism takes away freedom of speech and where parents can no longer determine how to educate their children and determine even their biological gender. It's already happening in many countries. It's starting now in Australia. Abraham's going after Lot is also a picture of grace. He went to save Lot at great personal risk. You know, at one time we were all like Lot, living in sin. God loved us and chased us down in spite of who we were. How about you and me? Are we battling for the Lots around us? How many men did Abraham take to war? 318. How many did they go up against? The armies of four kings. Yet, he could ambush them and won a decisive victory. So it's not about numbers. But what, and what does this say about Abraham? Yeah, he chose to fight the right war. And God's favour was demonstrated over him. So choose your battles. You don't have to be right about everything. Now, there are many things that are, st uh, uh, are stirring around you that you don't even have to pay any attention to. They could be just a distraction to God's destiny and purpose for your life. Truth number two. Claim booty appropriately. Can you say that together? When Abram returned from his victory, two men came out to meet him. One was the king of Sodom, who somehow survived the battle uh, and escaped with his life. And he came and offered Abram all the booty, all the spoils from the victory. Now this was everything you know, that Kedor Laoma plundered from the five kings. What was this king of Sodom doing? Well, basically, this is what he's saying. Abraham, take everything. You deserve to be rewarded for your victory against such overwhelming odds. Man, you are a great general. All the glory, all the spoils belong to you. But also behind it, behind the release of this wealth and riches to Abraham, this king was also angling for a future alliance. The other king was called Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? He's a mysterious figure. This was his only appearance in the Bible. And after this, 
We don't see him again. He's called King of Salem, which means peace, and which is, of course, Jerusalem. And he was also called Priest of God Most High. So Melchizedek was a king and a priest, not a politician like the king of Sodom. His name means King of Righteousness or King of Peace, Salem. And all he offered to Abraham was bread and wine. Then he blessed Abraham and declared that it was God who delivered Abraham's enemies into his hands. Two kings coming before Abraham. One with wealth and the possibility of an alliance which could then you know, make him politically stronger. One with just bread and wine and a word about what God has done. It has been said that the greatest test comes at the height of one's success. Read that again. The greatest test comes at the height of success. At this critical moment, when Abraham was flushed by his tremendous accomplishment, God sent Melchizedek. His presence there was to counter the king of Sodom. Melchizedek's words were clear. The victory was God's. And his success was a result of God's blessing. What would Abraham choose? Immense wealth and power or bread and wine? What booty would you choose in life? Abraham snubbed the king of Sodom. He would in no way become indebted or beholden, beholden to this wicked king. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 23, read together, I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal tongue from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I am the one who made Abram rich. Well, this can be interpreted as sheer arrogance, but I believe it's a conviction that came out of Abram's knowledge of what Sodom was like. He wanted no alliance with that. This is a great lesson to learn. You know, many people today are indebted and beholden to evil kings, evil powers. They have become ensnared and entrapped by the riches, positions and opportunities offered by the wealthy, the high and the mighty. You know, Satan tried to do the same with Jesus Christ. I go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I once had a lady who came to tell me that she wanted to divorce her husband. And after lengthy counselling with both husband and wife, I found some troubling things. Now, this lady was making a lot more money than her husband. And at that time, she was being recruited into a political party and there were opportunities and chances that she could go for, she could be brought into high office. Her husband was a manager in a small company which was struggling to survive. And uh, she would ridicule him and sometimes become even violent towards him. He actually had some scars to show for it. And I finally came to the conclusion that she was actually ashamed of her husband and believing that he was an obstacle to her dreams. Naturally, I counseled that it's wrong to divorce. One day, I received a phone call and she was on the other end. She said she has consulted pastor so-and-so and elder so-and-so. 
And she said, they all agree that she can divorce her husband. <laughs> I was uh, surprised uh, by that. And I tried to remind her that whatever pastor or elder have said to her, the, the Bible says something else about divorce. And at that, she suddenly screamed over the line. She literally screamed. Her voice was so... I, I was bowled over. And, and this is what she said. Do you know who paid the tithes to your church? I was shocked by her outburst. All I could say was, thank you, but please keep your money. Of course, I never saw her in our services anymore. Abraham did not merely accept Melchizedek's gesture of friendship by sharing the communion meal of simple bread and wine. He received the word that was given to him. And then on top of that, he gave the priest king a tithe. This is the first time tithing is mentioned. It came out from his own pocket because he had already rejected the spoils of his victory. Abraham openly demonstrated that it was God who deserved the victory. You no know, tithing expresses in a tangible way that God has the glory for every victory and every blessing in my life. Do you have a Melchizedek in your life? Someone who can puncture your ego when you are at the height of success? Abraham chose the word of Melchizedek and gave the glory to God. That's truth number two. Truth number three, share honour generously. This is something very special about Abraham and I like it very much. It comes from Genesis chapter, 20, uh, chapter 14 and verse 24. Read together. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Aina, Esco, and Memory. Abraham himself, remember, did not accept a single threat, a single threat from Sodom. But now, he wants to make sure his friends were rewarded for their part in the victory. And remember, these are not even, these are not even uh, Hebrews. Huh? They are not even part of his tribe. They were just friends. In other words, he not only gave the glory to God, he honoured his supporters and allies. That's another danger Abram avoided in his success. He did not forget his friends. In the flush of an achievement, it's so easy, it's so easy to forget it actually takes many people to help one man fly an aeroplane. The honour he showed his allies was practical and tangible. Give them their fair share. Let me share how I put this into practice in a small way. When I was senior pastor of my last church, because of the size of the congregation, we conducted many weddings, funerals, and other celebrative events. I was also often invited to do seminars and preach in other churches. From these extracurricular activities, <laughs> we can call it that, uh, we will be given what was, was called what are called honoraria, uh, i.e., a payment for services rendered. Some of these can be quite handsome gifts. And there will be nothing wrong if I choose to keep them. Especially at that time, my monthly salary was somewhat mediocre uh, relative to the responsibilities and finances I managed. But I felt the Lord impressed upon me that whatever I did or was able to do in and out of the church was only possible because of my staff team. So I created a staff fund and mandated that all money gifts received by myself and others would go into that. 
And every year, we would use that fund to either finance or subsidize an annual staff holiday together. Do you know that some of the best and most profitable businesses in the, in the world today practice what's called profit sharing? Have you not heard of that before? Does your company practice profit sharing? <laughs> or if you run a business, do you practice profit sharing with your employees? Let me surprise you with one of these companies. Or if you know of one, would you like to put it down in the uh, comment box? The company that I'm going to tell you about is called Huawei. Is not even a Western company. The owner and the founder of this company owns only 1.4% of its billions. The rest are shared with his staff. So it's not surprising they have talented, loyal, and hard working staff. Are there people you should share honor with in this stage of your journey with God? Are there counsellors, supporters, and helpers you have forgotten now that you have won your victory? How about the people who fought for you, prayed for you when you were going through your trials? How about now, honouring them in a practical and tangible way as soon as possible? Give them their fair share. As we move with God, the same choices come to us regularly. There will be battles on the journey. Who or what will you fight for? Look to Abraham, the Bible says. By God's grace, we will have victory. And then kings will come and make us offers. It's nice to get some glory every now and then, especially among our peers, and be recognized as one of the best. But ultimately, who gets the credit? Either we claim we did it and deserve everything we get, or God did it and should receive all the glory and all our tithes and offerings. Finally, get back to the people who have served you in your time of need and honour them with their fair share. Let's recap the truths from the life of Abraham today. Number one, choose your battles wisely. Number two, claim booty appropriately. Not everything that is put before you is supposed to be taken. And number three, share honour, share reward generously. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for the life of Abraham. We thank you that as he came out of Egypt, you began to bestow him with increasing favour and most of all, wisdom to choose who and what to fight for. You gave him discernment and a heart that's willing and able to receive words from Melchizedek, so that he give you all the glory and to be able to refuse all that the wicked world has to offer him. And finally, Lord, for his incredible and, and, and amazing generosity to those who have supported him and fought with him, Father, I pray right now that you will begin to impress these truths upon all of our hearts. Write them, Lord, upon our spirits so that they become part of our character in the days ahead. 
Hallelujah. Even right now, I want to encourage you as you look at the, the conflicts around you, and I'm sure every one of us is engaged in some of them. And they may, they may even right now be before you. The Lord is saying, choose. Don't have to prove that you're right in this thing. There are more important battles ahead. Don't get distracted and lose your sense of purpose. Hallelujah. And for those of you who have been blessed right now, think of the people who have supported you, who helped you, who counseled you, who prayed for you, who sacrificed for you. What have you done for them in return? Lord, I just pray right now that you will stimulate and activate in all of us the spirit in Abraham. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We commit these uh, truths to you, back to you, and we ask the Holy Spirit to constantly remind us as we go through different seasons of life so that we become victorious children of Abraham. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, we all say, Amen.